All right, hello, and welcome to working with d3.js. Um, this is gonna be a basic tutorial and introduction to what D3 is as a JavaScript library and a little bit about what it can and cannot do. Um, so like I said, this is D3. And it's a JavaScript library that's incredibly useful in visualizing data in web browsers. Um, the D3 comes from it being a data-driven documents library. And basically what that means is that the data becomes the driving force behind what you build with D3. So essentially you would build a table based on the properties that your data has rather than building a table and then forcing your data into it and adjusting for all of the different properties and attributes um, that your data has after you've built that table. D3 allows you to build the table based on that data. Um, so D3 was created to be a reusable data visualization framework that could be repurposed. And that's kind of a big component of it is the repurpose aspect. So rather than having to create your own um, framework that's tailored to your code every single time, you can repurpose a lot of the methods and things uh, that D3 provides for you. Um, couple other awesome parts of D3, uh, there's thousands of different templates called blocks um, that are available from the D3 website. and these are basically like starter code kind of or small projects that have been done um, that show you how to do different things and we'll be working with sort of a mini block later on in our demo um, and d3 also has hundreds of methods that instantly provide programmers with visualizations for things that otherwise would be really tedious to make and really extremely time consuming um, good examples of those as you can see here um, as the D3 shape of branch. And this contains a lot of different methods that quickly create graphical primitives. And so in other words, you basically have these existing methods for generating say a pie chart or setting the radius of an arc rather than drawing it out in regular JavaScript yourself where you'd have to draw a circle and then implement the angle yourself. Um, and so this not only saves a ton of time in that you have these methods that already create things like this, and it's not just shapes, there's also maps and lots of different calculations available on their documentation. And so it's, it's not just a time saver, like I said, but it also allows you to create more meaningful visualizations through the use of dynamic variables rather than static ones that you might have um, if you're building your own code. So that's kind of a little bit about what's great about D3 and a quick bit here to remember about when you should and shouldn't use D3. Um, it is somewhat time consuming. It's pretty, pretty friendly to use, um, but it does require a bit of setup and it is built for projects that have large amounts of data that need to be displayed. Um, so if your visualiz visualization is relatively low scale or not using a ton of data, it might be faster and easier to simply hard code it in your regular JavaScript rather than work through the implementation of D3. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when deciding whether or not it's the right tool for your project. Um, so because of these abilities to handle huge amounts of data, and especially around the dynamic and interactive visualization components, D3 has become really, really popular among people like media programmers who often want to display things um, such as a map, for example, that allows users to interact or change the, the display in their web browser. And so I have a little example here. Um, this is a New York Times map um, of the 2016 election made with D3. And it's pretty neat. You can see a basic map here. And if I hover my cursor over it, um, you can see the interactivity there where it'll tell you the breakdown of Democratic and Republican and Libertarian votes and everything um, per state. And then even if I click on one, um, as you can see, it'll zoom in, break it down by county. Um, so you start to see the power of D3 and how it can really uh, applied to a lot of different data visualizations and be useful in a lot of different aspects. Um, so what makes D3 particularly special 
uh, is this ability to create dynamic and interactive data visualizations that are really easily scalable. Um, and to show this, we're going to be demoing how to build a simple histogram with D3. So right here, as you can see on the screen, is what we'll use for the starter code. And this is an index HTML file that loads in D3 through a CDN. Um, and that's this line right here, as you can see, the CDN to import D3. You can get that link from D3's website. And the starter code also is going to set the size of an SVG where we'll be creating the actual visualization, or rather where the visualization gets created. And that SVG, it stands for Scalable Vector Graphics, and basically what you need to know about it for D3 is it's basically what D3 uses to render its visualizations. Um, so after you've created your index.html file, which again is this basic code right here that imports uh, D3 and sets your SVG size, you are going to create another file called script.js and this is where you will actually write all of the code for your D3. Um, and the first bit of that code that we're going to write into the script file is this line right here that initializes the data object to contain random numbers. Um, this would normally be where you're going to import your JSON, XML, or CSV data for projects. Uh, for this demo, we're just going to use random numbers. And so we have this handy line that initializes data into an array of 10 random numbers within a range of 500. And that's all that's saying. Um, so next, we're going to select the SVG from our HTML. Um, that's what our second line of code here is doing. And then use the width and height variables to get the SVG's width and height values. Um, remember, this is the width and the height that we initialize in our index.html file. Over here, you can see the width is 960. Um, and the height is 680, and so those are the width and height that we're referring to um, when we have these variables for width and height here. Um, the last line is going to create the container G that all the child Gs are going to go into, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we start to actually create the visualizations with those Gs. So next, after we have the information for our SVG, it's time to actually use some of these handy D3 methods that we've been talking about. Um, and so in this code block, we use the histogram method from D3 that takes in uh, an array of data samples. So in this case, it was that random numbers array that we generated with our very first line of code. Uh, and it uses that array of data to generate a histogram based on that data. So again, when we talk about D3 being a data-driven document library, this is where that comes from, is using the array of data to create that histogram, rather than building a histogram first and then putting the data into that. Um, so as I mentioned a little bit before, one of the benefits of D3 is its handy scaling functions. And those are really nice because they allow us to convert our data into usable units. And so now that we've got the histogram generated with that nice histogram method that we just put in, um, we can use the linear scales that start at zero until the width or height of the page. Um, and so what we do with these scales is they use <clears throat> the scales are used in order to convert the units of our data to the size of our screen. Um, and so that's, that's a really nice function of D3 is that it does that scaling for you um, with this scale linear method. Um, and you can see we're doing that for the x-axis and the y-axis right here. Um, so this is also where we use the width and height that we set for our SVG to scale our data properly. And that's what, again, what that width um, for the X as the X axis is gonna be your horizontal width and the Y axis is obviously gonna be your vertical height. Um, so moving on. Um, so the G's that we made earlier, 
that we said we were going to talk about again. This is when we get to and we're going to fill it with the visualization of our random number data array. Um, and so for each element in our data array, we're going to call um, the D3 enter method that you see here. Um, so selecting all of the um, all of the elements in our data array and then using the enter method um, for each bin basically and so this basically what this does is it decides how to place each bar on the histogram and so the append method right here after the enter one what that does is it adds a rectangle to each G with the height corresponding to its Instagram value, or its, its, its histogram value, excuse me. Um, and that's from our earlier, earlier scaling that we did here. Um, so once you have that scaled height, you used the append method um, to actually put that, that bar into the G with that corresponding height. Um, and then down here with our bar.append rect, we add the rectangles to the bars. And basically what that does is it draws the black bars on the DOM and it has the functionality of D3 to basically go straight from creating those um, bars for the histogram based off the data in our data array and then sending those straight to the DOM. Um, and that is practically it. So to show you um, what the output of that ends up looking like is here we have our histogram and we have 10 bars. Remember, because we selected those 10 different numbers um, and because they're random numbers, of course, if I refresh the page, um, you'll see the bars change as we generate different random numbers. Um, so yeah. That is a data-driven histogram based off your random numbers array. And of course, um, if you wanted to delve further into it, you can use D3 to add interactivity, change the scale, um, and create a dynamic graph that changes based on whatever your data's needs are. And that's just about it. Thanks for listening.